All right, welcome back, everybody, to this new episode of our podcast. We have a wonderful guest here, uh, Shelby, Shelby Williamson. Um, you're on our podcast today, and we are very happy to have you. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah, super Fantastic. exciting. Yeah, super exciting. And we want to hear a little bit about you and your life. So if you want to uh, jump right in, uh, can you give us a little bit of background, who you are, what you do? Sure. Uh, I am the head roaster for Huckleberry Roasters. I'm also doing their green vine for Columbia right now. Um, I've been roasting for about uh, eight years now, and uh, I'm also the 2019 U.S. roasting champion. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Yeah, that was an amazing win. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was very surprised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, how come how come surprised? You worked hard for it. <laughs> uh I, I had never competed before, you know. I think that was mm -hmm. part of it. And I was mostly competing to um to learn and to meet more people in the United States uh for competing. Competing was actually my coworker's uh Kevin Nealon's idea. Mm -hmm. Um and we kind of did it on a whim. So I think I was kind of surprised uh how far I made it. <laughs> Yeah, that was super cool. Uh, maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about that right away. Uh, how um, how was that uh, prepping for uh, roasting competition and then also the competition itself? Um, well, I mean, for the U.S., we have so many different uh, stages to our competition. I, I didn't realize how different it is from uh, European and uh, other countries' uh, competition phases. Usually they just mm. have one. They have one mm -hmm. big competition because they don't have so many people uh, as opposed mm -hmm. to the U.S. Like they just opened the new preliminaries for the U.S. roasting competitions, which luckily one of them is in Denver. Mm -hmm. um, nice. But uh, yeah, like I I didn't realize how many stages there were going to be. Like I did our local one first, which was through like kind of our local chapter. And I ended up winning that one. Um, and then there was the preliminary, which again, at that point was in Denver uh mm -hmm. and I took second in that one so I kept kind of just doing doing well but it was a, a lot of time uh mm -hmm. I didn't really expect it to be as much time as uh as it was uh and to be fair I think those first two stages I definitely made it a lot harder on myself than I needed to <laughs> <laughs> uh, that means you just went all in yeah, I, uh, I, lo I love to overcomplicate a simple situation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I green graded that entire 20 pounds that you receive. Mm -hmm. So the way that the early ones work is that they send you 20 pounds of coffee, you do whatever you want with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as long as that isn't, you know, uh, trading it out for a different coffee. And mm -hmm. I think I, I spent probably, I'm going to say at least 20 hours in a <laughs> dark room with a black light sorting out yeah. all of the defects Whoa. in that coffee uh, mm -hmm. and then I screen sorted everything uh, and then I roasted I think 350 gram batches until the 20 pounds was completely roasted and wow. then I chose like the top the top um, batches to make a blend out of those ones so uh, I, I definitely overcomplicated it but uh but it seemed to work so well exactly you won so it's uh the result <laughs> uh, yeah. speaks for itself um so do you <laughs> you think that's uh that was a good strategy um to sort of go really very deep uh or what's your what's your take now after the fact i think more than anything um i just learned a lot during that entire period um one of the reasons that you know we decided uh, or I decided to screen size and to green grade everything is that those were things that I didn't really have much information or uh, data on, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I understood that there was such a thing of screen sizing. I understood the ideas of like how a pea berry is in theory, potentially a little bit more, um, I don't know, has more flavor, has more acidity, uh, mm -hmm. whether or not that's true, you know, that's that's a huge debate, but I really wanted to kind of have that um, information for myself. Mm -hmm. So um, I, in order to in order to do those things, I had to learn those things, right? I had to obtain a, a set of screens and screen size a bunch of coffee. I had to sit in a room and green grade a bunch of coffee and pull out every single defect. And so I think that, you know, and then we cupped everything. And it was so interesting to have data behind um, a project that you work on yourself and not just something that you're reading or something that you're talking to someone who has, 
you know, their own strong opinions and biases on it. It was something that was kind of tactile. And um, mm -hmm. I think that that's probably the, the best thing that I took away from competition was the the contacts that you make and the education that I received from just having to do it. Um, I'm, I was not a green buyer at the time. So, you know, when I got to the U S competition and I was told, you know, you're going to have to green grade something in less than 30 minutes. I was like, I, I don't do that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time, uh, green grading and, and it was also a great opportunity to convince my company to send me to go get my Q grader, um, so that I could feel more confident in the green portion of my competition. Mm -hmm. So did throughout this whole process, did you, were you kind of like <clears throat> leading your process on your own or did you have a coach or did you have kind of like a mentor or someone helping you along the way like to show you the steps in a way? Um, no. And yes, like I, I have, you know, I have a really good coworker and friend and Kevin Nealon, our, our green buyer. So I was able to, you know, ask his advice on a lot of things um, and, and also have him on the cupping table at the early stages where you're able to cup before you submit it. Um, mm -hmm. I also called on at the time Corvus's head roaster to come cup with us. I, I'm always a big believer in like the more people who can come cup with you and give you feedback, the better. Um, and, you know, that's that's how I got all of my tasting notes is that I had everybody cup and then I took the three that everybody had in common. Cause I was like, great, that compound is clearly in the coffee. So we're going to use those flavor notes for, um, all of my flavor calls. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I always have a lot of support. <laughs> um, but I don't know, I, I think to some extent <laughs> we weren't entirely taking the competition to, um, I don't want to say too seriously, but I think it was just, you know, something that I was doing. It was not something that I was overly concerned about, about winning. And so, you know, mm -hmm. we didn't, we didn't hire a coach, we didn't buy a bunch of expensive equipment. You know, when I got to the U.S. comp, I realized there were people who hired, like paid thousands of dollars to have someone take them through the competition. And um, I honestly almost didn't go because the competition was the weekend that they had that bomb cyclone that mm -hmm. came through in Colorado and like no one could get out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we were all trying to figure out how we were going to get to the competition. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Maybe we should just not go if it's this bad. But um, yeah, no, I, I have a lot of support and friends, but we never hired a, a coach. Mm -hmm. that, that's very interesting. Um, and also what I just realized, you were talking a lot about the before and the after, but it's a roasting competition. So you actually <laughs> talked about green grading, you talked uh -huh. about cupping, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but not the roasting itself. Um, so, and that is because that's something you just know what to do, uh, or that's not, that's not that critical, actually. But what's your perspective? Uh, well, in the early stages where you roast in house, you know, uh, I, I made a decision that I thought the the best chance that I have is to roast as many batches as possible to get as many mm -hmm. cracks at the coffee as possible. Um, roasting a coffee that you don't really understand uh, in one go, which I, I know roasters who did that and who did well. Um, I, I don't like that lack of control. <laughs> so I I decided to do 20 batches. Like I, I roasted a lot of coffee um, and I did it on a hookie because uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've worked on that machine in the past and I've always really loved the way that coffee tastes out of that machine. Um, so those were kind of the reasons that I did it. It was a small machine that I could do those batches consistently on uh, and I know the quality and the consistency of that machine. Um, mm -hmm. And I did the same thing for both competitions. Uh, for the local one and for the first preliminary. The U.S. competition is is quite different because essentially um, you show up and they don't really tell you anything. Uh, they give mm -hmm. you like a paper about the coffee. You don't really get to do anything with that coffee. You get to green grade it before you roast it. And you mm -hmm. roast on a machine that you've never touched before. Mm -hmm. So... In that particular situation, um, as much as I understand, you know, heat transfer theory and I can take, okay, it's this kind of roaster, so I assume it'll behave this way. Uh, what I did is I just uh, went and found a roaster that is the same model. And I was lucky to have the support of She's the Roaster. They sent me and a few other uh, people out to, um, to Mill City's headquarters 
and we got mm -hmm. to spend some time on that specific machine so we could just get some parameters of like what does the gas look like in this machine like mm -hmm. if i roast three pounds at a time what happens mm -hmm. um I mean, another thing I did is I just, I treated it like a competition and I, I read the rules very thoroughly. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that you get graded on is moisture loss. So I realized that if I roasted a three pound batch, I could be within like, I think it was like 400 grams off mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. I did that. Cause you just do percentage, right? So if I was like, there's 12% moisture loss, I could be off by like 6% and still be within the threshold. So I think that that's like, that's another part of the competition, right? It's a competition. So mm -hmm. you need to read the rules <laughs> and you need to find the most effective way to be within the the grading parameters of mm -hmm. those rules. Um, I mean, I was a competitive volleyball player all through my life. So maybe that's that's where that comes from. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it helped. It was one less thing I had to worry about. Oh, it's great, great, great advice, I think, or or a great point, because ultimately, yeah, if you know how the game is played, you can play it. And mm. it's um, that also, I think it shows that you're a great roaster because you can actually uh, work with those parameters and, and get them where they need to be um, and not just follow what you have have been taught or what you have done for forever. So yeah, you have this, that flexibility. Mm -hmm. It's super important to be able to use your machine to the to its full spectrum, you know, like we mm -hmm. have a 15 kilo machine uh, that we roast a lot of single origins on. And um, sometimes we have certain coffees like uh, a Gesha that we pay a lot of money for that mm -hmm. we, you know, don't want to ruin or don't want to have a bunch of carryover at the end of the week. So sometimes I have to roast five pounds of a Gesha and the normal batch size is 20 right so being able right. to have like the control over that and understand that your probes will read differently you need to <clears throat> adjust your roast because it's going to be shorter it's going to be faster your probe readouts are not going to be anywhere near the same um those are all really important things to be able to do and and that are really helpful um for when you know your computer for some reason freezes and you don't have cropster to roast anymore <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, you need yeah, to be yeah. able to do it by sight, sound, and smell. Yeah. yeah. So will you uh, will you compete again? And uh, would you recommend it to others? Uh, I don't think I will ever compete again. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I really hate public speaking. The first two rounds involve like a solid two three minutes of just having to talk in front of everybody, mm -hmm. um, which I hate doing. Mm -hmm. And then um, the last competition was just very stressful. It was very stressful. Uh, and I won, so I don't ever have to do it again. That's <laughs> yeah. kind of my thought. Been there, um, done that. <laughs> that's right. I, I went one in and then I'm finished now. Um, yeah, I I really enjoyed it. It was definitely a really good part of my uh, coffee journey. And I think I'm really happy that I did it. Um, but I also kind of believe that I got to have this really amazing experience. I won, I kind of, you know, solidified my space in specialty coffee for now. And uh, and also like when you win, you get to go to Origin and you get to go with the other coffee professionals who also won um, those, their competitions. And I just, I don't really, not to, not to say that I would win again, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think it's kind of other people's turn, I guess, is mm -hmm. the way that I look at that. Like, I work for a company that sends me to Columbia. I I work for a company that has good resources and, and takes care of me. So I don't really feel the need to continue um, trying to boost myself up, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have enough visibility. I don't I don't need more. <laughs> but through that, I hear a little bit, hey, others, please come in, step up and and go for it because it's a cool experience and you can learn a lot. For sure. And and not to diminish like the experience of winning or anything like that, but I know plenty of roasters who are better than I am, um, who just don't compete because, you know, mm -hmm. that's just not a part of their life. Like they're not they're not into the clout side of uh of coffee competition and mm -hmm. um and winning was really good for my company right like that's a great piece of marketing 
that uh, our marketing department can take. Hey, our head roaster is actually, you know, a U.S. roasting champion. And, and that just sounds really good to um, restaurants and cafes. And um, I feel like I've kind of already, you know, already done that. We won a good food awards. We were U.S. Uh, uh, ma macro roaster of the year. Mm -hmm. So I we don't need more titles right now, I don't think. <laughs> And uh, and I just hired a brand new production roaster who has never roasted before. So she's like three weeks into learning how to roast and she's going to compete in the Denver competition. And mm -hmm. I'm going to use that as a um, stepping stone for her to really learn how to roast in mm -hmm. a in a controlled and kind of a easily measurable way to show, hey, this is what you've learned this is what you need to learn. And now here's a test for you to kind of try to put it to, to work. Uh, and I've already told her, you know, there are no expectations, um, but it's a good, it's a good experience. It almost, so it almost seems like obviously your goal when you compete, when you compete is you want to win in a way, but also it seems like your goal just as much as, as important was you wanted to learn. And, you know, you're not the first winner to actually say that on the podcast. I've heard that a few times now. And it almost seems like when you go in with that approach of like wanting to learn, it clearly has worked out for the better when you're more focused on the educational part of it than like, I have to win, I have to win. And that's that. And you ended up winning with that kind of approach. Yeah. I mean, I think um, when you do an approach like that, because uh, even in the the last stage, you still have to write out what you're going to do and why. So you have to write out almost like a mini essay of like the choices that you're going to make how the coffee is going to taste. And so in order to do that, like you really have to put a lot of thought into it. And so I think that when you go from a, a learning approach where you can really explain what you're doing and why you're doing it, it, it helps you um, one, be su more successful on the roaster, but I think it just, it just helps you uh, prolong your knowledge in, in coffee. Um, yeah, I, I've learned so much from that competition that I took forward uh, and Huckleberry still has the screens, you know, and so we use those from time to time as well. So it's mm -hmm. been a really good experience. And now I have all of these uh, educational tools that I'm like qualified to pass on to somebody else. And I'm I'm really excited to uh, teach a brand new roaster how to roast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super cool. That's amazing. So I, I wanted to uh, use the word Colombia, which you mentioned already, to segue into the next kind of area of, of interest here. And that's uh, your responsibility as a green coffee buyer. So you, you're you yeah. in that area. What's, um, what's the specifics? What, what does a green coffee buyer do in your case? And um, how did you get into it? Yeah. Um, well, I am. I work under... Kevin Nealon, uh, who's our head green buyer, he does all of our main uh, main lot buying, and uh, I'm I'm still very very new to green buying. It's an area that I think most roasters kind of gravitate towards once they've roasted for some time. Uh, for me, that part of coffee has always been the most interesting part of coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, once I actually learned what specialty coffee had to offer, um, but my specific parameters involve, you know, Kevin basically will give me a, a budget and will tell me you need to bring in this much physical coffee. Um, so right now I import all of our decaf uh, and I import uh, three or four smaller lots from Colombia. And um, one of the reasons that we chose Colombia was that I think it was just the first trip that Huck really sent me on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I absolutely love Colombia. It's so beautiful there. I don't think, I don't think I've seen a more beautiful place in my entire life. And I've traveled quite a lot. Oh, you're um, telling me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, it's it's gorgeous there. And all um, and you know, my my best friend is from Colombia, and so uh, it it just kind of made a lot of sense for me to take over that piece as kind of like a, again, it's a stepping stone to learning how to green buy. Um, because there is so much to learn. And again, I've had a really good partner in Kevin to be like, Hey, I want to buy this coffee. And then he'd be like, Ooh, let me tell you why you shouldn't do that. Or mm -hmm. let's look at, let's look at what it looks like under a black light. Okay. Like, what is this going to look like in six months? You know? Mm -hmm. Um, but my job essentially is to find 
uh, smaller lots of coffee that are typically a little more uh, special than a blender lot, keep it within budget, within reason, and to also make sure that, you know, the way that we're buying is, um, is as ethical as possible, which I know that that's kind of a, that's a bit of a trigger word. Um, sometimes when I look deeply into the ethics of buying coffee, I'm like, should, should any of us be drinking coffee? Should <laughs> Like mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's so hard to, um, to do things perfectly. And I think that's mm -hmm. just because, uh, coffee in general is run by people and people are not perfect. So there's always, mm -hmm. there's always going to be ethical gray area. And, and the best that we can do for me, I draw the line of like, is the importer or sorry, is the farmer happy with the money that they're receiving, um, from the middleman? And what are the things that we can do to, um, make sure that they are happy um, mm -hmm. I know in one case we've, we've paid the farmer outside of the importer as like a, a premium on a quality coffee. Um, mm -hmm. but that's, that's really where I draw the line. Like I, I can't, I can't control everything that happens down the line and, and every importer has a negative thing to say about every other importer. So it's really hard to, to tell what's true and, and what's good quote unquote. Mm -hmm. I mean, for sure, it's a tough business, and it's uh, it's one it's an evolving business too. I think you can come in with certain new uh, demands or new ideas, like paying more or mm -hmm. uh, well pushing quality. That that in, in mm -hmm. itself is is a challenge. Um, and with that quality comes potentially more pay, but also potentially more work for the farmers. So it's it's very complex, as is any other aspect of our life. Yeah. So it's like whatever product you opened this morning to uh, mm. to eat or not, uh, you know, <laughs> do you really yeah. know everything? <laughs> oh, for sure. It's it's a very fine line. Like it, it, sometimes it feels like you can't really win. And, you know, I think sometimes there is this um, habit of coming at it of like, oh, I'm going to help these people. Like I'm going to I'm going to buy this coffee at a higher price and help, you know, again, quote unquote, these people. But really, um there's there's a little bit too much of um ego and white saviorism in that situation and so you have to be really mm -hmm. careful about you know how how you want to help if you are able to help um and like for me like I don't know anything about growing coffee I don't own a coffee farm I don't um, the best thing that I can do is take the coffee roast it and give them my feedback on it that's that's all that I can do mm -hmm. um so I think you know staying in your lane being respectful of everybody's part in the process and um, yeah, I think it, it's just a really hard thing to do perfectly. So I, I try to just make sure farmers are happy with the situation that they're in. Mm -hmm. uh, the coffee quality is good and the, a fair price is being paid um, for that coffee. And mm -hmm. that's that's all that I can do if, I, if I'm going to remain in coffee. I think that's like, that's one thing too that... <clears throat> That people kind of there we can I feel like on this side of supply chain we there's like a wide assumption that we need to help everybody and that everybody wants help and it's like that in theory yeah. is great and it sounds good but it sounds like the, from what I've learned there's a lot of farmers here that are producers here that's just like they just want like they want to get paid and that's mm -hmm. that like it's so, and like some people just want the transaction and like well mm -hmm. me maybe I want to like I would want a relationship like that I also respect and understand that like that's chill. I pay you, you give me the coffee and ciao. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think that all of the models can exist, right? I think we get really strong headed in this idea that like, there's only one way to do things. And uh, I think that a good example is, you know, we work with one, uh, one partner in Colombia who is not only a producer, but they also, you know, export their own coffee and they kind of tried to do every piece of the supply chain to try to keep more money Mm -hmm. in Colombia, which I think is great. I love that. That's why we work with them. But I also know that a lot of farmers are not interested in that level of work. They, mm -hmm. you know, we don't work with farmers who necessarily sell wet, but um, it, they're not interested in controlling every part of the process. They're, if the sea price is high, like it was this last year for them, they're like, why would I do more work to make specialty coffee when I could sell it commercial and not have to do half of the processing that I do for specialty, um, mm -hmm. for them, it's, it's a business. Like I work with a few farmers where it's definitely a, a crown jewel. It's the pride of their, 
their life. You know, uh, one of my Colombian farmers is like that. I, every time I visit his, his farm, I almost don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but not every farmer is like that. It's a business to a lot of farmers. And I think that that's, that's totally fine. And there needs to be respect for the farmers who don't want to do those things. And they want to work with a middleman because it's an easy way to sell their coffee, even if they get less money. Um, you know, they're basically outsourcing a service that they don't want to do or that they can't do, or, um, there's a, there's a home for every coffee. And I think that it's fine that people do that. Obviously there are some situations where farmers are being taken advantage of, and I don't ever want to be a part of those situations. Um, but I think it's fine if farmers don't want to do the extra work to make, you know, really high level specialty yeah. coffee. I, th I think it's all a, a, a dynamic uh, which we can ha either help or 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 not. And uh, what you just said, like you, you first of all, you know the farmers. That is already amazing. A lot of a lot of uh, roasters or a lot of businesses don't go that far. They buy from the importer. That's kind of where it ends. Mm -hmm. And um, and also that that's that there's nothing bad with it. Uh, it's just you already go down and have that transparency and you have that visibility. Um, and then there is uh, there's market dynamics you can incentivize. You can say, well, you, you know, I pay you more because I know that you have more work for it, mm -hmm. and uh, and we value that, and we also market that, and we also charge our customers, the roast, the the the, the, the coffee customers in the cafes or in in buying the green buying buying the bag of of roasted coffee. We charge them the price they they need to pay. Yeah. So it kind of works for everybody, and uh, I think that's what we are always trying to promote to push the industry a little bit further it's like well probably and then and i put myself out there a little bit but probably a, a, a bag of coffee under 20 bucks is not really cannot be really sustainable yeah. in most in most cases right and maybe mm -hmm. some blends maybe some lower grade coffees yes yeah. but you know it's interesting i just had this conversation yesterday well i have this conversation a lot especially when i like go home to my parents because you know when mm -hmm. people are like oh what coffee do you roast that's great let me see the website oh my god 27 <laughs> <laughs> uh yep. you know that that to them is such a foreign concept because they're used mm -hmm. to going to you know walmart i'm from a small town and and mm -hmm. you have to go to the next town over to like get groceries right um mm -hmm. and so they're used to their options of like Javalia and and Starbucks and and to them buying a bag of like fifteen dollars Starbucks is like really splurging, right? So the idea of buying not even a pound of coffee for like over twenty dollars is crazy. But my old production roaster, who actually just moved to Mexico for a really great opportunity working with an importer, mm -hmm. uh, just sent me a picture of a coffee that was you know roasted in the supermarket for four dollars a pound, <laughs> and and he's like, I don't know how to feel about this because. I'm in Mexico. It's Mexican coffee. So they're not paying import fees. Like maybe it's a, a roaster who also owns the farm. So there are like a lot of, a lot of factors that could be adjusting to this. He's like, I think even if you're paying C price for this coffee, this is still like so cheap. It's so mm -hmm. cheap. And, yeah. you know, I don't know how to feel about that. Um, and mm -hmm. I think the U S in particular is, uh, the worst offender when it comes to having supermarket coffee that's like, you know, five dollars, six dollars for a bag of coffee. Um, and I, I can't buy them anymore because I mean, one, because they taste very bad, but also because <laughs> <laughs> also because like now I just can't I can't buy coffee under a certain price because I just know how much money uh, they probably mm -hmm. paid for that coffee. Right. I don't think that's that's always the the race to the bottom is is, is not really a beautiful thing. Yeah. So uh it I, I love efficiencies. Mm -hmm. I love when we say, well, maybe we can cut uh well centralized data data or have more uh, access, uh streamlined processes. Those those things I, I really like. At the same time, <clears throat> some things cannot be cut. Like the corners cannot be cut. They need to stay where they are, and that makes the specialty special. And that comes mm -hmm. at a price. And I think when people understand that, and, and they do, right? So that the specialty market is growing and it's still growing in the US. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and oh, technically yeah. we, we are in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a critical situation economically, but mm -hmm. uh, it, coffee is doing all right. So you know, yeah, specialty I, coffee I, is doing all right. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, we definitely haven't really suffered in the last uh, bit of time 
uh, as far as a company. So we've been really grateful for that. But I think that, you know, people who are really into coffee, it's like people who are really into to any consumable good, um, mm -hmm. like whiskey, people are willing to pay high prices for a bottle of good whiskey. And I think that mm -hmm. coffee is starting to trend that way that people are starting to realize um, what coffee can actually taste like. And, you know, I think everybody kind of has the story of like introducing a friend into specialty coffee. What do you do? You give them a natural, right? Because that's like <laughs> no trained palate, nothing needed. You can taste the difference in that coffee. And it really just like blows people mind. Like, I didn't know that coffee could taste like this. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that this was a coffee taste like it's like, yeah, because you've been, you know, buying pre-ground, extremely dark coffee. And that's what you think, you know good coffee is 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 super dark bold <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um but but when you give them a good cup of coffee they're always kind of surprised oh I don't really like light roast but this is so interesting and it's so different and um your coffee doesn't have to taste the same every single morning you can have different kinds of coffee that are not flavored you know it's like they have different their own inherent characteristics yeah yeah no totally and I think that's the that's really the beauty of uh, of specialty mm -hmm. and that's I think can create a better life for everybody for yeah. the drinkers of course and for the farmers and to do yeah the dynamic is really complicated and it also has been historically created we know of problems right this mm -hmm. this it's out there uh we're working on in initiatives or on ways making it better Personally, I'm not a big fan of like the help uh, dynamic anymore because yeah. <clears throat> I feel like it diminishes one one party's participation in the game or in the in the situation. Mm -hmm. It's, it's condescending. Like... Yes, that's the word exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that is kind of a uh, an instinct that I find very common in the U.S. That there's this concept of helping. And I think the concept of helping is is good in that you want to help someone that's good. Yeah. But also like really knowing your place and mm -hmm. knowing what you can do. If you really want to have a partnership with a farmer who needs help and maybe they'll tell you, I need to hire an agronomist. Great. Mm -hmm. What you can do is you can raise money and you can pay for that agronomist mm -hmm. and let them hire the agronomist, let them do everything um, because they're the ones who really know what's going on right they, they know they know their land they know more than you do or could ever know about farming mm -hmm. um because that's their area of expertise so i think a good example is you know kevin works with a group of farmers in, in guatemala and he used to live down there mm -hmm. and he tries his hardest to you know not come in and say hey you need to do this Car kevin's not a farmer he he doesn't know how to grow coffee right but um, what he can do is he can take his experiences from traveling to other places and say, Hey, are you interested in, you know, these different processing type? Here's, here's information. We do a blend made of their coffee every year around the holidays called sister winter. Mm -hmm. And we sell that. And the portion of that goes back to the farmers. Like we just take a percentage of the profits on that coffee and it goes back to the farmers as just a lump sum of money for like, Hey, we sold this much of your coffee this year. In addition to the price that we paid for the coffee, here's this. And that's money that they can spend however they like. Like, you know, I know that they bought bricks meters. We've built, you know, had them, they built raised beds for drying some coffees. And and then Kevin does what he can to try to sell the coffee that we are not going to use from that group to other roasters in the United States. So he kind of um, does what he can, gives them funding through selling their coffee and then the rest is kind of up to them. Yeah. No, no, I think those projects are fantastic and, and helping in general is not a bad concept. So I, I, I don't say that sure. at, at all. <laughs> I, I think it's short term. So helping is more like project or, a, mm. or a, hey, I need something now, which I cannot have. Um, but really looking out for each other is a different concept for me. It's, it's more a long symbiotic. Term. Yeah, I was like, it's a symbiotic relationship because it's not just us being like here, you know, here are all these tools for you and it's so selfless. Mm -hmm. No, what are we going to get out of it? We work with the same <laughs> farmers year after year. So mm -hmm. like this last couple of years that that producing group produced their first round of Gesha, which was delicious. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and we were able to have first choice of that because, you know, we work with them so closely. So that became ours. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing, like these farmers would be like, here are the lots of coffee that we have. We go, great. We want these ones and the rest, like we're going to try to sell somewhere else. Um, so it's, it's not selfless. And I think that mm -hmm. the more honest we are, that the fact that it's not selfless, the better, like we get benefits both through having better quality coffee, but also like Kevin does not have to spend all of his time looking for new coffee. It's like, I know that I'm going to buy two lots or three lots from single farmers in Guatemala, send me all of the single farmer lots from my group that I work with, I will take my top pick and then we will move the rest somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a benefit to us. It's, it's right. not a, it's not a selfless act, you know, which is fine. I think that's fine. No, I think that makes it everybody. sustainable, right? Yeah. That makes it on the long run uh, work that it works. Otherwise we are only short term. And I think that's where, that's where a lot of those market problems come from. It's short term gains or short term losses. And um, you, you hunt for the best deal, but the best deal is only available in that moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at it on a, on a longer run, um, it's not good for the environment. It's not good for the people. It's not good for, yeah. for anybody really. So I think that vision is what makes the difference. Mm -hmm. And that's what you just said. Like what do we work together as partners? For sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, making sure that you're working with partners that are being sustainable is another one because it's not mm -hmm. just about, you know, it's not even just about like me as a person wants to work with sustainable farms because that's what you should be doing. It's like, I need you to be sustainable because I want to buy your coffee in 10 years. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't want yeah, you yeah. to be, to be uh, just, you know, monocropping your land and it's going to, your quality is just going to diminish year after year. I want your quality to be amazing every mm -hmm. year getting better all the time and you know you're surrounded by avocado farms that are ruining your area but like hopefully your plot of land still stays you know fertile and um and you can produce great coffee year after year mm -hmm. I, I know so so i have i have been thinking about this question for a minute actually but i just can't figure out how to word it because i don't want to i don't want to butcher it <laughs> I've been like on the, it's like, it's, it's about the financial part. So like, so when you mentioned how you pay the lump sum of money to producers from, from that coffee, the sisters blend coffee to the producers in um, Guatemala, it makes me think like, and hopefully I don't butcher this, but there's always, there's, there's, there's been um, an assumption and, or, and maybe it's true, but like financial literacy is probably not a, as um, as high as maybe other places sometimes i think we, we assume that a lot so my question to you on that part is like is there ever like a like has there ever been a, a moment or like a reason for you all or, or us on this side to kind of want to um like educate more on that part if you if you see there's kinds of like some some gaps there um on that part Does that make sense saying are you saying like back to the farmer to educate or back yeah, yeah. to, yeah. um, you know, to be honest, the farmers that we work with, I think are pretty financially literate. And, okay. uh, like one of them in particular from Colombia was kind of like, Hey, I need more money. <laughs> like mm -hmm. this is my cost of production. This is what, you know, uh, it's selling for, but realistically, like I need more money than that. And we were like, yeah, your cup score was like 90 this year. So fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I don't know, and I'm always very hesitant to, um, beyond out of my scope, which is literally being like, here's your green score, here's your roasting score or your roasted coffee score. And this is what I can like, you know, give back to you. I'm always pretty hesitant to, um, mm. educate, you know, educate back, which, you mm -hmm. know, when I go to origin, I am the one who is learning, uh, at pretty much all time going to origin for me is a benefit to me and my company. Um, and maybe it's a benefit to the farmer in the sense that like we're building like uh, an emotional bond to some extent. And so like mm -hmm. I'm going to want to work with that farmer year after year. And so he has a sustainable source that's always going to purchase his coffee mm -hmm. um, or her coffee. But um, yeah, I think me going to to origin is not a not a benefit to the farmer in the sense that it's it's mostly a benefit to me and my company. I get marketing photos. I get to, you know, 
see where the coffee is being grown that that really just gives you an emotional attachment to the coffee it makes you buy it year after year because you have all these beautiful marketing photos you're able to sell it better um and as an employee like it incentivizes me to stay at that company yeah mm-hmm. like so, so do your producers ever also ever like have any interest also though in knowing from your perspective like the market side on like what the market is on in the u.s like what are it, what's changing like what are the what are the preferred pro- flair profiles now like is that something of interest to them s- still or is that a conversation that's ever had a few do yeah a few are interested they're kind of uh, i think they're mostly interested in how their coffee is doing so like they want to know if they're you know falling behind in some way like of a coffee trend but to be honest i think that um the growers dictate the trends and i think we don't really like realize how much that's true because you have one grower who plants, you know, Gesha in an area. I'm just using that as an example. I know that Gesha is kind of, uh, I, I think it's on the the other side of its of its mountain right now, right? And like it hit the peak and it's like kind of not in quality, but in like how special mm-hmm. it is because there's so much of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, you know, someone, someone in an area that nobody had Gesha plants Gesha. And all of a sudden it's this coffee that's making more money than anyone in the region. Mm-hmm. So everybody starts to plant that. And all of a sudden that's what's available, right? Like we can only Mm -hmm. buy something that was planted three years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think to some extent, like the growers try something, it's successful in whatever markets, there's more demand for it and it gets planted. So I think in more ways than we recognize, the, the growers are the ones that are dictating the trend. It's just, it takes one, one really, um, inventive producer to mm. dictate the trend right mm-hmm. damn they, they yeah. called i think they called influencers right yeah yeah influencers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly that's true uh, the yeah. original the original influencers influencers they don't even need social media yeah it's just do yeah. it <laughs> yeah uh, and I love that. Like, I love when uh, producers are interested in in playing around with their coffee and and making something new. And I work with one producer in particular in Colombia. Um, I mean, I work with a lot of really amazing producers, but going to his farm is like, uh, like he has a science experiment going on all the time. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and uh, and it's just really interesting to see like what different producers are doing. You know, he's like, oh, I've got these beds hanging at different angles because the wind comes in from this area, and I'm like. Wow, you know, I have different shoes to go into every single area of my farm because I'm not going to take something from like where my dogs are into this area or, you know, like very, very detail oriented. And then I have, mm-hmm. you know, producers where there are dogs laying in the drying beds. So <laughs> it, <laughs> it, it's a, it's quite a spectrum and I I, yeah. I love it. You know, it's it's the most interesting part. I love growing stuff and I love uh, I love plants and I love um, I have a massive garden every year. So um, going to farms, and I grew up on a farm, so going to farms for me is like truly something special. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it connects you what what is to the real life in a way. Yeah. And to the to the realities that we live off the land. And mm-hmm. we we might not, if you live in a city, you don't see that so much any, anymore. But I also grew, grew up in a farming community. So it's, and of course, I, back then I didn't value that much or no, realize what it what terrible. it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I hated growing up on a farm, and when I was a kid, and and now I look back and and realize how very lucky I was that uh, I had a very different experience from kids who grew up in the city, and uh, I have a whole skill set that I don't didn't realize is a skill set because everybody could do that or. It was mm-hmm. just normal. It was normal to do those things. And and now it's, you know, people are always astounded by my massive garden. And I'm like, this is just how you do it. I, you yeah. know, like you, <laughs> I don't know how you think this is special because this is just normal for me. But um, but it is nice because for me, that's like a great connection with the farmer, too, is that, you mm-hmm. know, we talk about uh, growing stuff um, mm-hmm. and having gardens and because a lot of them have their own gardens as well. Um mm-hmm. Some of them. It's always astounding to me how many farmers don't grow their own food, right? They they literally mm-hmm. grow commercialized plants for their entire farm. Right. And then they take that money and they go buy like dried goods at the mm-hmm. at, at, in the town. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you could have fresh vegetables 
all year round. Yeah. And they're like, no, 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 that's that's space that I can make money off of. We don't put food there. <laughs> so I was like, OK, like, that's crazy to me. But I guess I just don't understand. And that's, you know, that's fair. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the best part about going to the farm is being fed by the farmers, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Their, and their wives love me because I'm like, I will eat two plates and take some. <laughs> yes. I eat everything. I'm not yep. vegan or vegetarian. I eat everything and I will eat <laughs> two plates because I don't know the next time I'm going to eat. So we're going to eat 4,000 calories in this thing. <laughs> and you get those as extra points. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. No, I love it. Um, it's been really good. And, you know, I'm always learning and, and, um, and I'm wrong sometimes and I change my opinion and uh, I think that that's totally fine uh, as far as green buying goes. You know, I think we all start mm -hmm. out at this very uh, high point of what I would say is like false morality of like, oh, I'm only going to buy these kinds of coffees from these kinds of farmers and, you know, kind of coming from that point of like helping. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then once you spend a little bit of time doing it realizing what the realities are between your own business needing to make money and the coffee producers needing to make money um you start to kind of realize how complicated that whole situation mm -hmm. is and have a whole new appreciation for how yeah. much work goes into it and both on the farming and the sourcing side <clears throat> so i've just been really lucky that you know huckleberry has provided a, a bit of a stepping stool for me that like I, truthfully, I think they're like Shelby's getting bored roasting, which is fair because like production roasting is rough after a while, mm -hmm. right? Like the, it's mm -hmm. a long, hard day and it's very repetitive. And I do really like roasting. But at the same time, when you do any job for years on end, you know, mm -hmm. um, it starts to become mundane no matter how great it is. And mm -hmm. so I think part of it was like, well, we don't want you to go anywhere and we want to offer offer you an opportunity to expand your knowledge so we're going to have you work under the umbrella of our head green buyer so that you can like learn the basics of green buying you can learn how you know you even order coffee from the warehouses that they store it at you know which is always mm -hmm. amazing to me that it's literally just an email chain it's not a portal <laughs> like, or, or whatsapp a, or WhatsApp. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Texting, you know, like it's, it's wild to me that that's how it is. You're like, I'm just going to attach an email to these three people. They're going to send it out. A truck is going to arrive and the coffee's going to be here, you know, like um, those kind of global logistics are so interesting to me or how we can like track our containers as they're coming across the ocean. Or uh, Kevin does a lot of musical chairs with the ports that the coffee is mm -hmm. going into because especially during COVID, uh, mm -hmm. We had a lot of shipping issues um, where it was like, OK, Port of Oakland is absolutely destroyed. They don't have people to unload the boats. Stuff is sitting there for months. What can we do? Can we go through the Panama Canal and like get it to Houston somehow? You know, like um, so that was very interesting to watch him maneuver um, mm -hmm. and, and just trying to figure out how can we make sure that the coffee arrives where it needs to arrive. Yeah, yeah, that was a wild time. Like, totally <laughs> crazy. I, I think Kevin had a little bit of a, a, a emotional death during that, where it's like, <clears throat> you know, he had done everything right. He had ordered enough coffee. Oh. He purchased what he needed. And the coffees that we were really excited about, no matter what we did, just showed up so late. And yeah. nothing tasted the way that it did when we got the samples. And, you know, there's also a, a pretty big no-no to reject coffee. Um, mm -hmm. that isn't like totally defective so it's like yep yeah, this is this is what we're doing I guess this is what we have now <laughs> and that puts extra pressure in on, on the roaster too right to, yeah. to see what can I do with that raw material to still mm -hmm. make the best out of it for sure yeah I mean that's something that we deal with all the time oh this is starting to taste like age what do we do you know and is there something that we can do that isn't just I don't know take it darker <laughs> The, you know. To me, that's always when the rubber hits the road, right? In crisis, you can see mm -hmm. how are your suppliers doing, uh, well, how is the internal machine working, and then also how are how is your consumers? 
How is mm-hmm. your how's your customers behaving? Are they now just following whatever is very convenient, or also there is is there a certain loyalty? So do they understand this is very very complex, mm-hmm. and keep paying the twenty bucks for what they should or twenty seven or what what it is right to mm-hmm. keep the machine alive because ultimately it's easy to get off get, go out of business during such a time. Honestly, we don't get very much pushback on our online prices. I think that we have built a base and the pandemic, honestly, and this sounds very terrible, but like really helped our online business. Mm -hmm. Like our online business was fine, but I think, you know, for at least that year that nobody was going anywhere and we had contactless like pickup for coffee. um, The pandemic did a good job of pushing customers to online specialty coffee because they thought, well, I can't go to coffee shops anymore. um, So I'm going to start buying really nice coffee for my home. Because mm-hmm. that's my treat now. My treat is no longer to go to the coffee shop. My treat is to have really expensive right. coffee. And um, and it introduced a lot of people into understanding like, hey, you can actually make really good coffee at home. You just have to buy the same quality of coffee that you get from your coffee shops. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so like our online business exploded uh, yeah. during the pandemic. And we haven't really lost much of that business, even though the shops have returned. And so... Um, yeah, like our online customers, I think understand like each coffee is priced for what it needs to be. Like we don't just have like our bags are twenty five dollars. Our bags are kind of variable prices mm-hmm. depending on what we need to charge. The place that we found the most pushback from people is uh, when you raise prices at the cafe. That's mm-hmm. the one that people that people have mm-hmm. a hard time with because I think <clears throat> people who aren't interested in specialty coffee they're just going to a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. Right. Like they don't they don't necessarily choose Huckleberry because it's a specialty coffee shop. They just go there because they like the they like the environment. They like the food that's there. The coffee is good. And that's all they that's as far as they look. So Mm -hmm. when you go in and it's like, how much for a cappuccino? You know, and I don't know what ours is right now because I'm never at the cafes. But like it when we raised our prices to be able to afford to pay our baristas well, Uh, and to pay our staff well, and to continue with the margin that we need to operate and to grow. Some people did not like it. (laughs) Yeah. It, it, that's, I mean, that's a general dynamic right now where um, everybody needs to uh, raise prices in a way. And that's, that's how the world works. And uh, it's not always easy to navigate that. Uh, mm-hmm. or communicate that well um and it's also also sometimes it's just you know because all the prices uh, are are up so mm-hmm. you need everybody needs to up it too yeah you cannot just say well this is a new product and there's something more or better that's probably easy on a coffee bag um but yeah. in the cafe maybe the cappuccino is the, is the same excellent cappuccino as always and now For it sure. becomes the, the norm but mm-hmm. you know but while you're in that growing space where it's like people are like, well, I could go to Starbucks and get, you know, whatever they're a 20 ounce cappuccino for. Yeah. This, until this until you're not right. Because they also raise prices at some point. I mean, it's, it's yeah. just. Every, everybody's going to raise those prices. I still remember when I was in Europe and this is before I worked in specialty coffee. I mm-hmm. was just a, just an addict at that point. I was not in <laughs> specialty coffee for any other reason than the fact that I was just addicted to coffee. <laughs> and I went to Switzerland and I had just come from I was living in Moscow and so everything is like pretty cheap in oh, Russia yeah. uh and uh I went to Switzerland and I went <laughs> to like a Starbucks Ooh. and I got like a just a drink I was like okay this is gonna be you know I, I didn't have any money I'm doing the shoestring travel through Europe so I was like I'm just gonna get like uh I'm gonna get a latte so it has like a bunch of fat and calories in it so I can make it through till dinner and they were like great that'll be like 16 francs and I was like (laughs) (laughs) and like I did the conversion it was like a 22 dollar cup of coffee and to me at the time that was totally outrageous um and then I just you know I realized everything in Switzerland is expensive and this is just the life that they live and this is their economy that they have sustained um so I think, yeah, sticker shock is, is fair, I think, but uh, <laughs> it's real. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real thing, but it, but it is what it is. Like no one yeah. else around me was concerned about it. Just, just me and my <laughs> friend who were both very poor, like, oh, well, I've already ordered it and I don't really speak German. So I guess that's, I guess this is what's happening. I guess I'm paying for this coffee. <laughs> 
Well, and the right to uh, talk about it so many years later on a That's podcast. That's right. It's it's an anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> Trauma is nothing but stories for later. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's I think that's a beautiful uh, um, saying for for the ending. So I uh, I really really appreciate that conversation. I think it was very insightful. Uh, thank you for for sharing with us your your life story, your professional story. Um, and yeah, I'm very very excited to get this out on the air. Yeah. Yeah. Heck, thank you so much. Heck yeah, Shelby, this was dope. This is this conversation was so real. I really I thank really enjoyed you. it. Yeah, it was so thank cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, I was happy to be on it. Yeah. yeah. Sick. <laughs> Exciting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>